Welcome to Warwick Anglican Parish and our online faith formation course based on Archbishop Rowan Williams' book, Being Christian. This is our second session. So if baptism, the subject of our first session, is a beginning for us, it marks out our, our identity, it uses symbols of oil and water and light to remind us that we are immersed in the depths of life, what happens next? If faith and life are a journey for us, it would be useful to know where to go to next. And perhaps the idea of reaching for a map isn't a bad one. This particular map, the map of the Bible, charts the growing relationship between the one God and humanity. God speaks and humanity responds, as the Archbishop notes. That response or conversation includes different forms of writing and reflection. Some of it is about law, the laws of God for his community. Some of it is song or poetry or story or history. All of it seeks to ask or respond to the question, who is this one God and how does this God act? And as a result, how do we respond? How are we to act in the world God gives us to care for? If the Bible is like a map, then for us as Christians, Jesus is a bit like the compass. His life and death and new life, his words and actions, help us as people of the Christian faith to interpret and look at the rest of the Bible. It's not just a story of faith, but it's our story of faith. What the Bible is and how we use it is the subject of that second chapter. So if you haven't read it yet, I'd suggest perhaps you pause the clip now, have a read, note down any questions, thoughts or comments you have, and please do share them on our Faith Formation post. So, where to next? We tend to think of the Bible as just one book. Actually, it's not. For Christians, our sacred text contains, give or take, 66 books. 39 of them belong in the Jewish scriptures. Sometimes we call that the Old Testament. And the remaining 27 are contained in the Christian scriptures, or sometimes we'd call that the New Testament. While it's not one book, literally speaking, we believe as Christians it tells one story. So we try to look at it, as the Archbishop notes, as a whole. God speaks, humanity responds, and a relationship emerges. This relationship is not always easy to discern. There's a story about a man called Jacob in Genesis, that very first book in our Bible. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, who is the great patriarch of the Jewish people. Jacob is wrestling with somebody on the banks of a river one evening. He's wrestling and he's struggling and he won't be overcome. The person he's wrestling with is never given a name, but there is a firm suggestion here that this unnamed figure is holy, perhaps even God himself. Sometimes, like Jacob, we wrestle with the text. We wrestle with God has what God has to teach us or tell us. Sometimes the text shows us how people have been very out of tune with God's love and grace and chosen to live with their own power in view, lives of violence or cruelty or injustice. Some parts of the text we know have been used to justify causes that would seem to us abhorrent. Human slave trade would be one of those, while people have used other parts of the Bible to justify the very opposite opinion or stance. There are verses and sections of the Bible that appear to double up, contradict, repeat certain phrases or themes. We have two creation stories. They sit beside each other in the opening chapters of Genesis. Some scholars suggest that this is evidence of multiple authors. There are four Gospels that tell the story of Jesus in the Christian scriptures, but in the ancient world there were more than four in circulation. They just didn't make it to the Bible we have today. The Bible, of course, wasn't written in English. Its parent languages are Hebrew for the Jewish scriptures and Greek 
for the Christian scriptures. A little bit later, Latin became the go-to language. It was quite a while before the church permitted the Bible to be translated into the nations, different nations' languages, English being among them. It was also a while before punctuation, chapters and verses were added in. All of this means that it is a complex and beautiful book. It challenges us. It's not a static point the way people came to and read the Bible a thousand years ago, 500 years ago, even last century is perhaps not quite the way we might approach the text today. And that's part of its beauty. It offers us something for our lives in everyday and 